Hi there guys, Rick here, back again for another Q&A session. It's a bit of a special one this one because I just got my hands on a Nuno Betancourt N4 guitar and it's an amazing guitar. So I'm going to be rudely interrupting myself with licks like this. <laughs> If you're a Nuno fan, I'm a massive Nuno fan, you might recognize some of the things that I play during the interruptions. So here's the first question. This question was posted on my page or YouTube or somewhere. I don't know exactly where, I don't know who did it, but I thought it would make a good question for this uh, Q&A session. And it is, Rick, which was better? Being mentioned by John Petrucci in Guitar World magazine or Eric Johnson posting your Cliffs of Dover cover on his official Facebook page? Both of them. Both of them, they were definitely, for me, monumental moments for me as a guitar player. Um, when I found out that Petru John Petrucci had mentioned me alongside some other guys in Guitar World magazine, an interview that he did, I was just gobsmacked. It was just incredible. And recently, a few days ago, a few days ago most of you guys will know already that uh, Eric Johnson very awesomely indeed posted my cover on his, uh, on his Facebook page. I was blown away, absolutely just humbled, basically. Um, I first came across Eric Johnson back in 1993. A friend of mine had uh, Arvaya Music on and he said, listen to this guy, played me the CD. Or oh, was it record at the time? Might have been vinyl, actually. Uh, but he played Cliffs of Dover. That was the first track I ever heard. And I was like, oh my God, who is this guy? So I immediately got that album. Then I went and got Tones. Um, you know, and I listened to those albums religiously. Um, and that was during a time when I had nothing. I had no money to live on. I was literally scraping sort of two peas out of my room, in, you know, and I would sort of live off cans of beans, you know, that I could afford from those two peas. Uh, but I had my guitar and I had the music. So, you know, looking back on those times it, and, no, and what happened a couple of days ago, for me, it's just amazing. Nothing beats it, it's just phenomenal. So yeah, both of them, just phenomenal. So question number two from Matt Reynolds. What did you look like after you lost fat, but before you built muscle? Did you already have a lot of muscle underneath? Good question, this one. Um, I started losing the fat back in May 2000, 2012, and I got down to what I thought was my ideal weight in uh, September 2012. Um, but looking at the pictures now, I didn't look very good at all. In fact, here's a picture uh, of me in, I think it was September 2012, and then there's some other comparison pictures from like June time, so have a quick look at this. So as you can see from that picture, um, I still had a lot of fat on my frame, not a great deal of muscle either. Um, but uh, that, the, the, the comparison picture taken back in June, uh, I've certainly built more muscle now. Uh, I've made more gains, <laughs> um, so it's going really, really well. Um, so I'm into the second year now of my training and I'm just gonna keep going because I love it so much, it's, it's fantastic. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of what I looked like after I lost the fat before I started training. <laughs> Question number three is from Lewis Cannon. I'm gonna leave a link to um, Lewis's uh, YouTube channel. The dude is fantastic. He's got an amazing physique. He's been lifting for a while and he looks phenomenal. Uh, he's also a fantastic guitar player and just a top guy. Uh, you know when you meet guys that you just think, man, you know, doesn't get better than, than you. So Lewis, you're a top geezer. Uh, and he asks, what camera do you use and have you become a hobbyist photographer? 
Um, I use a Canon 550D um, for video mainly. Occasionally I take photographs with it. I did go through a phase where I bought a macro lens and I went out taking pictures of spiders and insects and stuff like that. Um, and I kind of really enjoyed it, but it didn't last long. So um, I enjoyed it at the time, but it's not something that I continued. So um, next question from Lewis is, what do you make of compressors? Are they important on lead tone? Uh, I tend not to use them that much, to be honest with you. Um, just not something that I've incorporated into my rig very much. Maybe I should, who knows, but I don't use them that often. Uh, and finally, when you composed the track Inside Out, was it immediately after a conversation with God? <laughs> I'm presuming you like the track. If so, thanks a lot, man. Um, for me, that's one of my favourite. Um, it's hard for me to say favourite because I generally i am not massively keen on the music that I come out with. Um, but that off that album is definitely probably my favourite, actually. Um, and it was one of those tracks that... I left alone for a long time because I knew um, there was a melody in there that fit the music perfectly. Um, and I waited for a long, long time. It was, I think it was a good year or two. And I went back to it and uh, I just listened to it over and over and eventually the melody came. And it kind of reminds me of, I was watching um, a documentary and it was an interview with Bjorn from ABBA or, or Benny, it might have been Benny actually. And he said that, you know, if you wait outside a cave long enough, you know, a, the dragon will soon come out if you wait long enough. You know, and that stayed in my mind, you know, to do with songwriting and stuff. So, you know, if you wait long enough, the right melodies and the right parts will come out. And for me, that's what happened. So glad you appreciate the tune. <laughs> Number four, hi Rick, congrats on the mass destruction guns. My question is about the acoustic stuff. I discovered your work a long time ago with your cover of Spanish Fly back in 2009. Thanks. So I started watching a lot of your finger-picked acoustic videos like the Bark pieces, which really inspired me. But I noticed that you haven't done any new videos like that in a while, with the exception of the Collings demo. My question is, why did you lay off the acoustic stuff? Cheers, dude. Thanks for the question. Um, time, really, um, and work. Uh, a lot of my work nowadays just zaps my time. So it's really, really difficult for me to sort of put the kind of practice and playing time in to the, uh, the classical guitar uh, than I do with the electric guitar. In fact, I don't practice that much with the electric guitar, so it's really, really difficult. But now they've got the Collings, I really, really am um, gonna push myself to try and practice uh, fingerstyle more. I absolutely love it. And that acoustic guitar is just, yeah, it's mind blowing. Well, probably the best acoustic guitar I've ever played in my life, it's phenomenal. So please expect more finger-picked stuff. And I'm gonna do some bark arrangements for acoustic guitar as well. So I've got lots of stuff lined up for my YouTube channel. So I haven't abandoned it, you know, uh, finger style and classical is really important to me. So it's something that I will always do, but it's kind of taken a back seat, but that is gonna change. And this is the final question. I forgot to put down who actually asked it. So apologies. Was there one song in particular that inspired you to play the guitar or one that pushed you in a particular direction more so than the others? Um, there were three, I would say there were three main albums actually that really changed my direction as a player. At the time I was listening to uh, bands like Depeche Mode and The Smiths, The Cure, that kind of thing. And uh, my brother had, he bought back Master of Puppets and uh, I remember him listening to Battery and just thinking it was just noise. And I was saying, basically saying to him, what are you listening to that shit for? And he said, have you actually listened to it? So I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, why don't you do just that? Listen to the album and then come back and tell me what you think. So that night I said, all right, I'll give it a chance. Took the album, um, went into my bedroom, lay down on the bed, listened to the whole album, finished it. And I thought, hmm, I'm gonna have to listen to that again. So I listened to the whole album again. After the second listen, I was 
man, this is quality music. It just seemed to have one good part that followed um, and another better part that followed and then another better part that followed. It was just full of these amazing parts in the tracks. Um, so that, it's hard to pinpoint one song, but that album changed, completely changed my musical direction. Then it was um, extreme. My brother again bought pornography to the album and I said to him again, what have you bought that for? And he said, listen to this. And I think it was the, uh, it might have been the He-Man Woman Hater solo and then he played Get the Funk Out solo. I couldn't believe it. I was, man, it blew me away. So there was that and then Joe Satriani flying in a blue dream. When I heard that, that was it. I just listened to that album non-stop. To me, it was just magic to my ears. So. The majority of tracks off that just, you know, changed my life. So Nuno, Satch and Metallica, they're the ones that changed everything. So that wraps up this q and I hope you've enjoyed it and I will catch up with you guys very soon. Oh, one more thing. <laughs> Oh, my God.